It's our great pleasure to welcome uh, Mr. Bradford J. Bruton, Open Source Analyst and Collection Manager with the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, before I introduce him and turn the time over to him for his uh, lecture today, just a couple of brief announcements. So we are now on iTunes. If you're interested in downloading the podcast for our Wednesday lectures, uh, you can do that fairly easily just by uh, going to our main website at kennedy.byu.edu, and you'll notice the familiar podcast icon on the bottom. Uh, you can also download RSS feeds for our news and press releases and events and announcements here at the center, or you can sign up for the listserv, or e-news as we call it. Um, there's just no end to the amount of information you can get from the Kennedy Center. So um, if you, uh, we won't spam you, so just sign up for any of those things that you find uh, to be useful in your own little lives. Um, we'd like to begin with an opening prayer. and We've asked Alicia Barzi, who's a senior in political science from Kansas City, Missouri, to offer that prayer, um, after which I will introduce uh, Mr. Bruton. Father in heaven, we come before thee this day to give thee thanks for the opportunity that we have to assemble here on this campus and to hear the words of Brother Bruton. We're grateful for this institution that is designed for our education, both temporally and spiritually, and we recognize thy hand in all things. We are grateful for our Savior Jesus Christ and his role in our life every day, and we ask that thy spirit will preside here, that we may learn the things that thou would have us do to further our own knowledge that we may go forth and serve and be able to help others and to do thy will. We ask that thou wilt bless our speaker, Brother Bruton, that he may remember the things that he has prepared and that he may present them in a fashion that is pleasing unto thee. And this we say in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Bradford J. Bruton has worked as an open source analyst and collection manager for the Central Intelligence Agency for 23 years. In addition to a, to a variety of Washington assignments, uh, he served se seven field tours with regional bureaus, with embassies in Panama City, London, Tel Aviv, Bangkok, Asuncion, and at the Key West Naval Air Station. For the past 15 years, he's been visiting universities for recruiting purposes. He received a BA in history with a minor in Spanish from BYU after having served a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Guatemala. He received a JD from the College of William and Mary and an HBA in Jewish and Biblical Studies from the University of South Africa. Bruton married the former Rebecca Jenkins in the Washington, D.C. Temple, and they have three children, I believe at least one of whom is here today. He has taught LDS Seminary for a total of 16 years. We are very pleased to have uh, with us this day Bradford J. Bruton, who will be speaking on the role anal of analysis in the U.S. foreign policy process. Please join me in welcoming Brad Bruton. Well, thank you so very much for having me. I really am delighted uh, to be here. Uh, some of you may be aware, you may not be aware. I'll, I'll advise you uh, right up front uh, this is uh, considered to be a distinguished lecture series, and uh, Professor Leonard had arranged for a distinguished lecture to be here, and he had to withdraw. Uh, so I'll do the very best I can. Uh, I have a daughter here at uh, BYU, and she said, uh, Dad, it will be humiliating when they find out you're not distinguished. And uh, um, my advice to you is I've, I've kept Professor Leonard advised of that all the way along, and uh, I'll, I'll make it my very best effort. Uh, what I really want to do today, since I've had uh, the privilege, um, I work at the Central Intelligence Agency, but I work for a very unique shop at CIA. Uh, we've been called the Foreign Broadcast Information Service for 63 years. All of our products are available at the Lee Library. If you need a translation of any speech uh, given, or certainly any of the important speeches given by Fidel Castro, we provide those. Uh, if you need uh, to look at um, communiques issued by the French government or by any government, uh, we translate those, and we do analysis overseas. Because of the nature of my work, uh, I've had the opportunity to work in embassies for a total of 13 years. And so what I really want to do today, it's, it's an ambitious uh, effort, I want to give you an idea of what analysis works, looks like at the working level 
starting from the frontline trenches of us foreign policy which would be in our embassies overseas then working back to the analytical shops in washington and helping you to see how those uh, connect up i would just make a note and, and it's an interesting uh, thing perhaps uh, i met ambassador uh, david kennedy on two different occasions uh, in tel aviv israel in 1986 and in Bangkok, Thailand in 1989. What really impressed me about Ambassador Kennedy was his almost unlimited access to major figures uh, around the world. In uh, Tel Aviv, when he came there, the BYU Center was under construction. There were protests going on. He met with the Prime Minister, the Mayor of Jerusalem. He seemed to have wonderful access to very important people there. In Thailand, he came as an ambassador for the First Presidency of the Church, and he met with the king, which is absolutely extraordinary, and the prime minister and members of the government. And I heard him speak at church, and he was an absolutely charming individual. He was a magnificent diplomat, and no wonder he was able to gain access to so many places. He clearly knew the diplomatic uh, game very, very well. So it's, it's a particular pleasure since I'd met uh, Ambassador Kennedy before. And, and like I say, because I spent more than half of my career in embassies, I feel sometimes a bit more like a State Department person than a CIA person. So, so let me begin there at our embassies abroad. Speaking very, very generally now, I think it's fair to say that the foreign policy of the United States of America in its broadest outlines is to support the vitality of democratic institutions. And I can assure you that that is where the great thrust of effort in embassies overseas does reside. We're promoting democratic institutions wherever we are. Let me, let me list a few of these on the board. Um, obviously, when you think of democratic institutions, you think of those things in the Bill of Rights and in our government uh, that we tend to hold dear and that we aspire for other peoples to enjoy, uh, such things as free speech, free press, a free and independent judiciary or law enforcement mechanisms. We support free and open elections. Across the world. We, uh, there's something that, there's a term that we use and we say that we uh, support the policy of transparency. Uh, transparency is a bit of a term of art. Uh, uh, sometimes you don't know transparency when you see it, but you know uh, some things you see are not it. Corruption is not transparency. Uh, uh, a one-party state in a country that is theoretically a multi-party country is not transparency. Okay, So uh, there are a lot of things that transparency is not. We say that we promote transparency. What, what that really means is that there's a whole host of practices that we're simply not uh, in favor of. We're in favor of honesty, integrity, that type of thing. Uh, we promote free trade. And frankly, I'm going to leave it to Professor Leonard and to Dr. Hudson to talk a whole lot more about that. Free trade is also a term of art. I think we talk a lot about free trade, but what we're really talking about is free investment, which is uh, a whole different thing. And that's another lecture. Generally speaking, we support good education. We support rights for minorities and women. Uh, just this whole host of things that we hold dear here in the US. I don't mean to trivialize things, but we, um, but we encourage those things that are good, and we tend to discourage those things that are bad. Bad being defined as corruption, narco-trafficking, money laundering, alien smuggling, trafficking in persons, and this whole list of, of corrupt practices. Now, if you were to go to a U.S. Embassy and you were to sit around the country team table, and the country team meets, generally speaking, once a week, uh, frequently more often, you will hear the ambassador talking with members of the country team 
about a whole variety of things, but I can assure you the thrust of their discussions will be on the efforts of an embassy to promote these democratic institutions. Uh, when I mention ambassador, I'll probably say she, my most recent ambassador, was a career service officer, Ambassador Linda Watt, down in Panama. So if I use the term she or, or uh, uh, the lady ambassador, that's what I'm talking about. Let me give you some examples of how embassies really do make the effort uh, in these areas. Free speech. We believe in promoting free speech, and that means that embassy officials will go to speeches that uh, perhaps the host government doesn't want to take place. Embassy officials will go to speeches uh, that um, the host government may hope that the speaker would just go away, or just shut up, or just never appear again. Uh, I know of instances where the ambassador will assign her uh, uh, political uh, team lead to call the foreign minister, thank you so much for being at this reception the other night, all the little niceties. Oh, we see that so-and-so is speaking next week. The ambassador hasn't decided that if, she, if she's going to go herself or send a representative, someone from the embassy will be there. What does that mean? No tear gas, no baton charges, no hassling of the people there. That means we expect this speech to come off. And we expect this person to have the opportunity to say what they're there to say. So, and I've known a lot of political officers who've gone to speeches that probably weren't worth hearing, but to support the principle of free speech in foreign countries. Free press. How do you promote free press? In a lot of countries, if you're doing media analysis, you say uh, uh, a newspaper in Mexico City, Alex Celsior, it, it loves the pre-party, the Partido Revolucionario Independiente. Yes, Institucional, something like that. Uh, yes, because that's the party's newspaper. Okay? They love their newspaper. They just don't like the other newspapers. And they'd be happy if they went away. Okay? And sometimes the only truly independent newspaper, the one that's not sponsored by labor unions or opposition parties, is the one that's struggling to survive. How can you help that uh, newspaper? Well, the ambassador can get quite generous and she can call them up or have someone from the embassy call them up and say, National Day is coming up, the 4th of July, National Day. I would be happy to grant you an interview on that day. It, it will send a powerful message if the ambassador of the United States speaks to a newspaper in her office, in her residence, that people wish would go away. We bid other countries uh, well wishes on their national days. Okay, they're equivalent on the 4th of July. And normally we'll take out a full page ad and it will say, the president and the people of the United States of America uh, you know, bid uh, best wishes to the president and the people of Paraguay or wherever on their national day. It sends a powerful message where the embassy places these ads. So if the embassy is placing its notices in newspapers uh, that a lot of people wish would just simply go away, it sends a very powerful message. If they are given access to embassy events to take photos or whatever they want to do, it sends a very powerful message. So that's one of the ways that we promote free press. A free and independent judiciary, the State Department has a program whereby at major law schools, they will invite judges and justices from foreign countries to the US to visit. They'll organize seminars of three and four days. They'll bring in eminent legal uh, scholars from the U.S. They'll provide interpreters to our foreign guests. And then they'll send them out to the Utah State Supreme Court or the Texas State Supreme Court or to courts across the U.S. and, uh, and give them an opportunity to observe functioning court systems. That's one way that we promote a free and independent judiciary. All the computers in use by the Supreme Court of Panama were donated by the people of the United States. You do have ways to discourage a non-free and independent judiciary. Recently, there are elections in Panama. Even in the Panamanian press, there would be cartoons of the Supreme Court. Supreme Court building and a big sign in front of it in Spanish said, Baratillo, which means sale. Justice for sale. And you have instances where you see decisions come down that cannot be supported by, by law. Clearly, justice was bought. 
after the recent presidential elections of Hanoi, four members of the Panamanian Supreme Court received letters from the ambassador of the United States of America in which she informed them that their visas to the US had been canceled. They were not welcome here anymore. Many of them have students in US uh, uh, universities, children in US universities. They will not see them graduate because they have not, they had the opportunity to support a free and independent judiciary and they put justice for sale. Does this make sense? Is everyone with me here so far? Okay, free and open elections. Uh, we support, we give technical support, we give monetary support to foreign countries to help them carry off elections if they don't have the expertise to do it. The government will fund the Carter Center to go down and to consult with people. If they don't have the technical expertise but want to carry off a free and independent election, we will help them. If they don't want to carry off a free and independent election, we will put them on notice very early on that that's the degree of our expectation and we won't accept contrary results. Do you follow me? Uh, there's an expression, analysis drives events and events drive analysis. Analysis, events drive analysis in the sense that if there's an election, there's going to be a lot of analysis going on around that election, okay? But sometimes analysis drives events. If we do analysis that X country is coming to elections, they're nine months out, and they're nowhere prepared to pull off free and independent elections, perhaps the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State will go to that country and offer technical expertise. If they intend to do it but don't know how, we'll help them. If they don't intend to do it, we'll put them on notice that the results will not be acceptable to the international community and that we will, we will work that issue through our allies and that they need to reconsider their, their uh, situation. Anyway, transparency, free trade, rights for minorities and women. There are a variety of ways where U.S. embassies abroad promote these efforts. In Panama, our ambassador down there, she had an annual awards day for, uh, for women who are leaders in the field of politics, in the field of medicine, in the field of education, in the field of women's rights, and a wide variety of things. The press uh, covered these things. It really brought to light some individuals who were doing some wonderful work and might not otherwise have been heard from, okay? So this is generally, spe I'm speaking in the broadest possible outlines, I'm sure you're aware. But generally speaking, our goal is to promote the vitality of democratic institutions overseas, and embassies are geared to doing that. In the embassies, of course, you've got your ambassador, the deputy chief of mission, uh, you have the, uh, the state offices, the political section, the economic section, and then you have a wide variety of constituent offices. Uh, the, uh, the defense attaché's office, they're working with the military. Uh, the CIA, just a quick word on the CIA. Uh, the CIA is not overseas to spy in, in every country in the world. Now, they do spy in a lot of countries in the world. And in all candor, I just don't have anything to do with that because I'm open source, and generally speaking, they don't want to have anything to do with me, and uh, you know I'm not offended. Okay. Many times, what the CIA is doing in a foreign country is providing technical assistance or information to their intelligence agency, so together we can track the movement of suspect individuals, money launderers, alien smugglers, narco traffickers, and all that. Uh, we can help them get rid of such people, and we can avoid them coming to the United States. Or if they come to the United States, we can arrest them. Uh, the FBI's overseas and legal attache offices, the Foreign Commercial Service, uh, the Department of Commerce. <laughs> All these organizations may have specific functions, but they are expected to participate in this overall effort to promote democratic institutions overseas. Okay, now, let's begin to talk about analysis. Back in Washington, then, you have a wide variety of analytical shops, and I'm sure that you know who most of them are. At State Department, you have the state desk officers, who, who generally one for each country. Sometimes the larger the country, the more the state uh, desk officers you have. You have state intelligence and research, state slash INR. 
and that's intelligence at state, and those are the members of the State Department who are also members of the intelligence community. Most of the people at the State Department are members of the foreign affairs community. Okay, so there is a bit of a distinction. Obviously, at CIA, you have the director of intelligence. Those are the analysts at CIA. At DIA, you have vast analytical shops. A lot of the analysis that they do is military, but it's not limited to that by, by any means, okay? So you have uh, uh, virtually every military organization has some small uh, analytical shop. In the military command, Southcom in Miami, they're following and tracking Latin America. PACCOM in uh, Hawaii is following the Pacific. Uh, we have military commands overseas. Uh, all of these folks receive the products that we produce in FBIS because we're tracking these things from the foreign press, uh, if, if, uh, if you follow me there. How do they do analysis, then, on the things that I've discussed? These various goals that we have for foreign countries also serve as measuring and yardsticks for the progress of foreign countries towards being democratic countries. So not only do we promote these values overseas, but we use these same principles as yardsticks to measure the uh, progress of countries overseas. And that's a major part of analysis. Let me give you an example. Perhaps the most famous uh, in, uh, analysis is done, as I mentioned before. Events drive analysis. If the Secretary of State is going to go to a foreign country, there's going to be a lot of analysis that goes on before she goes. My organization, FBIS, will uh, look at the foreign media and see if the expectations for that trip are high, if the expectations for the trip are low, how it's appearing in the foreign media, what they're saying the substance of the trip is going to focus on. Perhaps that will match the agenda, perhaps it won't. We'll do analysis after the visit to see what they say about the Secretary's performance while she's overseas. Okay, so events drive analysis. But perhaps the most famous uh, method of analysis is what's called the National Intelligence Estimate. And again, because of the limitations of time, I'm, I'm speaking in, uh, in broad strokes. But the National Intelligence Estimate, uh, it, these are very well-known products. And there's a group called the National Intelligence Council, not the National Security Council, but the National Intelligence Council. And uh, there's an NIO, National Intelligence Office for Latin America, NIO for China, NIO for Europe, NIO for the Middle East. And they will lead, generally speaking, each country on the face of the earth will get a national intelligence estimate annually. And what that allows us to do is to get a current snapshot and then an estimate over time of the progress of that country. Are we clear so far? We're doing good, you know, if I become obscure, my goal is clarity, but I often only achieve obscurity. So feel free to stop me. Okay. The National Intelligence Estimate has about 20 sections. Okay. Frequently, National Intelligence Estimate sections are, are doled out to people from all across foreign affairs and the intelligence community. Sometimes they're done in-house at CIA, but very frequently, uh, I think smart National Intelligence officers get everyone involved, okay? And what we will do is, we will look back over the previous year and we will say, did we see evidence or the lack thereof of free speech in Haiti, for instance? I just say Haiti, because I've been to Haiti uh, many times, okay. D have we seen a free press or the lack thereof, evidence of, in the last year in, in Haiti? We bring in other uh, issues as well. Education, do they have a functioning educational system? Did they pull off the last school year in an acceptable fashion? Is the funding for education going up, going down? National intelligence estimates, generally speaking, do cover economic issues and that type of thing. They include all these various things. Uh, one time, I, I just mentioned this, uh, the NIO for uh, Latin America had doled out various sections of the national intelligence assessment for 80, and they got down to, to education. And he had already assigned part to the Marine Intelligence Agency. I didn't actually know there was a U.S. Marine Corps Intelligence Agency, but there was. And they had taken one section, and state folks had taken a section, INR had taken a section, DI had taken a section. He said, okay, someone has to do education. 
uh, who'll do it? And no one was raising their hand. And, and I raised mine and I said, you know, no one would really consider me to be an analyst, but I mean, it's just research and I, I can do the research and then I give it to you and you do anything you have to do with it. And he said, that's splendid. And so I did a part of a national intelligence assessment. It was, it was a lot of fun. Okay. We do these and then they are made available to decision makers on Capitol Hill. Uh, generally speaking, they're classified so they have to be carried down. They read them and then the person who carries them down brings them back to uh, CIA or INR or wherever they reside. And that gives that individual decision maker, obviously uh, anyone on the National Security Council can have them, cabinet members can have them uh, as they need them. And they can look at the snapshot, the way that we measure the progress of foreign countries in, in the road towards having vibrant and, and, and uh, vital uh, democratic institutions in that country. Another couple of methodologies of anal analysis that I might mention are biographical assessments. Analysts do biographical assessments, and they're based on a wide variety of things. As state officers at embassies overseas, or defense attaches, or, or other folks overseas, if they may meet people overseas, they might write that up. It, particularly if it's someone who appears in three or four or five years may emerge at a higher level of prominence in that country. Okay? Uh, then those things are brought together back in Washington into biographical assessments. What we don't want to have happen is we don't want to have someone elected president or prime minister of a foreign country that the U.S. government knows nothing about. That's not doing our job. We don't want officials of the United States to go overseas and meet cheerfully and politely with people who not only do not promote democratic institutions, but have a long history of opposing them. Okay? So, uh, so that's one of the reasons biographical assessments are done. Another method of analysis is, uh, I think you're all probably very familiar with the annual uh, drug blacklist. The blacklist is that we will look at foreign countries and we will assess their efforts to stop narco-trafficking, okay? If they are on the good side of the equation, we will provide them with money and technical support, helicopters, uh, radio systems, that type of thing. If they're not on the good side of the equation, uh, they're on the blacklist, that could severely impact on the amount of foreign aid that's given to that country, that could severely impact on the access that officials from that country have to U.S. government officials. Uh, the legislation, the intent of the legislation is that we are going to do whatever we need to do to promote uh, foreign officials fighting uh, narco-trafficking and drug cultivation and all that as vigorously as we do. And so the annual drug list is put out by CIA. Well, it's, the assessment's done between CIA and state. It's an official product of the Secretary of State, and, uh, and it has a high impact overseas. Okay, now, the, the nexus between analysts and policy makers and decision makers, okay? Theoretically, analysts do not make U.S. foreign policy, okay? Elected officials or their representatives, people approved by the Senate of the United States, the Secretary of State, Deputy Assistant Secretaries of State, uh, that type of thing, make U.S. foreign policy. But there is a very, very significant nexus between analysts and decision makers. Very frequently a decision maker will ask for an NIE, a national intelligence estimate, or they're asked for uh, a biographical profile of someone. An analyst will take it down uh, town to show it to them. They'll see that it's 30 pages long and they'll say, well, just give me the snapshot of this. Is Haiti making progress or is it not making progress? Sadly, Haiti has not been making progress for the last 15 years, I, I really regret to say. And so, so the analyst ends up giving broad assessments on the spot to the decision maker. Very frequently, an analyst may say to the decision maker may say, the head of the Panamanian Supreme Court is coming to the United States and has requested a meeting. I don't have time to read this bio. Should I meet with him or not? And the analyst is, is going to have to be prepared to say, based on our assessment that this individual has wealth well beyond 
their uh, family well-being and his salary. Our assessment is that this individual has put money for sale. Our uh, suggestion is that you not meet with this individual, that you have him meet with someone way down the line, and that will provide a significant uh, point for those folks. So analysts do work with policymakers. Very frequently, a policymaker may say, we've tried this. It doesn't work. What's something else we could try? So there's a lot of discussion going on. I taught seminary, uh, oh, well, goodness, now I guess it's been a dozen years ago, with the issue group manager for Iran, who was constantly going down to brief the uh, Senate and, and take his class in mind. And very frequently, they would ask him questions, and then they would say, OK, brother so-and-so, I don't know if he's still undercover or not, uh, we're at a loss. What would you recommend that we do? And you have to be prepared to make recommendations to policymakers on what's worked perhaps in other places or what the next step in the chain would be and that type of thing. Uh, some analysis has, we always say, analysts don't make foreign policy, but some analysis has very, very, very real consequences. I would point at the annual drug blacklist, okay? If the analysis puts a country on the bad side of the blacklist, that could impact the assistance that, that is given to that country to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, and it could very si significantly restrict the access of officials from that country to officials of the United States. So don't think there is not significant, uh, there are not significant and real consequences to analysis. Uh, policymakers trust analysts because analysts have the opportunity to stay focused on an area. They have some sort of history. They're talking to other individuals about what's working well and what, um, what is not working well. So they'll frequently ask for recommendations and ask them how to proceed. Um, really, I think at this point, uh, because we'd like to have uh, questions and answers, uh, I'll, I'll try to wrap up here. I hope that this has been helpful to you in, in seeing what's going on out there on the front line in the embassies. Uh, I think those folks are doing a magnificent job. It's the Department of State. It is the most difficult of all US agencies to get into. It's, it's the, the filtering process is just incredible. I think if everyone in this room went at it with all their heart and fasting and prayer, perhaps one person here could get through the filtering process. But to become an analyst, there are a lot of analytical shops uh, in Washington. And there's a lot of movement between one and the other. So generally speaking, my advice to people is just look for an open door. Because what lies beyond that door? More open doors. Okay? So you, you, you could very well find yourself, if you really pursue this effort, I understand for those who are international relations majors, it's a very, very, very demanding discipline, a lot of requirements. I congratulate you for that. Because I think, I think that the combination Really, acquire, uh, really gives you a basket of skills. You'll acquire a basket of skills that will be tremendously important. Let me just also say, if you've had the privilege of serving a, a mission in a foreign country and you speak a language, I cannot strongly enough encourage you to push your language skills out to the farthest level. Please don't just come back and take this 12 or 14 hour credit course and stop there. That is utterly insufficient to equip yourself to move forward uh, with that skill uh, in, uh, in the U.S. government. So really try to push that out. Let me stop there and see if anyone has uh, uh, questions. Oh, uh, let's see. Pardon? I, uh, lovely. Thank you very much. Well, my name is Jefferson Ramon. I was working with uh, as an intern in the vice presidency of Ecuador at the time that uh, there was, uh, you know, they, they overtook the power. And... Uh, one of the main causes was uh, of the free press, you know. Right. If you encourage so much free press, they will become corrupted as well. Yeah. And actually they, they have the power to manipulate people's yes. minds. How do you control that? Because that's what, that's what actually happened in Ecuador. They did both uh, a fine president and they just like manipulated the people's thoughts. Yeah. And um, that was actually the press that did it, you know. Yeah. It's, uh I appreciate that comment. In, in Ecuador, I was in Ecuador a year ago. Uh, I've been in Ecuador about 20 years ago, and it's just a lovely, lovely country. And 
Quito is perhaps uh, the most beautiful uh, city in, in South America. It really is. Uh, Ecuador has had two presidents resign in the last five years. Is that right? Um, but just as you can encourage uh, free press, you can discourage not free press. If a newspaper comes to the embassy and says, we want to do an interview with the ambassador, you can say, you're not a free organ. Of, uh, you're not a free journalistic organ. Why would, we, why would we allow you to do that? You manipulate public opinion. Why would we have you come in here? So, so and, and if you don't think that State Department officials are that direct, uh, then you've not witnessed it before. Uh, they will do that, and I think they do have to do that. So when I say we're looking for a free press, an independent press, we're not looking for a manipulative press either. You know, I remember an ambassador to Paraguay uh, 22 years ago on my first assignment. He said, I've, Stroessner was the dictator. And he said, I met with everybody here who calls themselves a political party. And they all say they believe in democracy. But their definition of, of democracy is that Stroessner is out and they're in with the same powers. And he said, I don't think that there are people in this, parties in this country who know as much about democracy as a pig knows about ballet. And, and, and if we look at Paraguay today, uh, uh, we were talking beforehand, I feel he's right. I feel he's right. So uh, we're not just there to promote press. We're there to promote free press. And that's a good example of where that's not the case. Yes, ma'am. You were talking about there being consequences for lack of free speech, free press, uh, a free and independent judiciary. However, China has had favored nation status for quite some time, and they do actually not fill the requirements that are needed for this, yet there have been no real consequences for China's human rights violations and everything else that they're doing that we oppose. Right. Uh, let me say this. I am here as a BYU alumnus and the father of a Kennedy Center student, not a representative of the U.S. government. Personally, I agree with absolutely everything that you said. Um, for myself personally, <laughs> I don't have a clue why we would even think of giving China most favored nation status. It, I, I, I don't have a clue why we would, but we have. Uh, I would tell you this. What the reporting that we're doing at FBIS right now, uh, the National Open Source Center, and by the way, if you have advanced Arabic skills or Chinese or Korean or Japanese skills, uh, I have some uh, vacancy notices back there and we're looking for folks like that. Um, we're looking at blogs across China and we are extracting from those blogs reports essentially of human rights violations in anticipation of the upcoming Olympics. People who are being shunted off to the countryside uh, for their families are not advised where they're going. They're only told, oh, they'll be back in, in well, I mean, well after the Olympics. And they, essentially it is that they don't want to run the risk of these people being seen by Westerners uh, while they're there in the country. So, uh, again, uh, you know, as, I'm not here as a representative of the U.S. government. I'm here as an individual and alumnus of BYU. I agree with everything you said. But write your congressman. Seriously. I, I'm very serious when I say, write your comments. So, yes, sir. Just, just one moment. This is a question about the WMD intelligence and, and how right. it came. In terms of organization, is there a screen between the intelligence community and the politicians that is able to edit selectively the intelligence that gets to policymakers? You, you talked as if there's direct interaction, but it doesn't sound like the president is talking to some guy that knows everything about WMDs in Iraq, he's talking to higher up screens. Right. Uh, generally speaking, the only politicians who have, uh, I don't even want to say unlimited access, the only politicians who have limited access to intelligence are members of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence and the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, the SISI and the HIPSI. Normally, other members of the Congress do not have access to intelligence. They can request a briefing, and a briefing can be drawn up uh, for them that does not include, uh, it may include classified, uh, this may sound like a, uh, work with me here, 
classify, but not highly sensitive information. Okay, uh, theoretically all classified as highly sensitive, but some is less sensitive than others. Only the Hipsy and the Sissy have limited access, and, and they don't have unlimited access. I mean, you know, if they were to say, who is your source on this? They're not going to be told a name or a location or about, under any circumstances whatsoever. Members of the cabinet <coughs> also um, uh, have uh, limited access. Sometimes they will put someone on their staff in for top secret security clearances so they can get access. I, I was in an office for a period of time where I was briefing the U.S. ambassador to uh, Moscow, uh, the former deputy assistant secretary of state, uh, I mean the number two man at state, uh, Thomas Pickering, uh, who's been an ambassador everywhere in the world and is an extraordinary man. Um, my bosses at CIA said, for purposes of these discussions, you may assume that Ambassador uh, Pickering has unlimited access, I mean, unlimited in the sphere of, of need to know and all that type of thing. I looked at a lot of folks at state, and, and that was extraordinary that he was given that level of, uh, of, of clearance. So on getting back to the whole WND question, you know, clearly there was a big breakdown there. You know, so is that helpful? Is that responsive to your question? Yeah, the question is just why. I mean, the there was contrary information that the intelligence community had. Why didn't – who was the screen that picked what got to the powers that be and what right. didn't? Right. Uh, George Tennant, I, you know, forgive me if it sounds like I'm dodging your, your question. The bottom line is I don't have the expertise on the way things work in the CIA to properly answer that question. George Tennant speaking at Georgetown University said clearly we failed to bring all the critical information together in one place. Clearly we failed to assess it properly and clearly, we failed to brief uh, the appropriate decision makers in the appropriate way. Uh, basically, we failed on that. And theoretically, they're working on that. Uh, how that's proceeding, we have the Director of National Intelligence now. I hope that that's creating mechanisms to bring things together. I personally, my expertise on how things work at state is better than that area of CIA. So I, I can't do more than that. There's a question up front here, please. Who has the question? Uh, right, here. right here. You mentioned uh, if you're concerned about some of these issues and uh, information that you've given us, write our congressman. Uh, my problem is I either never get an answer back yeah. or if I get an answer back, it has no relevancy at all right. to the question that I wrote. What do they do with the things we write to them? Who reads them? Who acts on them? Are they just putting a file? Does it, do the congressman actually have access to any of those letters? Uh, the only reason I can answer this question is my wife used to work for a congressman. Um, she said that her congressman <coughs> took them very seriously. I've written to congressman before, and I, you know I think they used my letter to line their birdcage. I you know I got no I had no inclination to believe that they ever read it. I think sometimes it's the luck of the draw, who your congressman is and how seriously he takes his constituency. And it also may have to do with whether they're facing a stiff uh, fight in an upcoming election as to whether they listen to you or not. And that's, that's all I can say. So, yes, sir. Back, back in the back. My time is your time. But I too. Yes, well, sir. Um, I am an international relations major, and I've, um, I don't have a... No, that's good. I think that's good. Well, anyway, like, I've thought a lot about of um, the possibility of, you know, working for the government and so on. And while I don't have any, like, set plans at this point, I just want uh, your um, advice on uh, things that we can do now. Like you said, like, you know, take an open door when they're available. What are things that we can do now while we're still in school in order to prepare and order to qualify ourselves so we can, like, um, pursue that course of employment? Sure, that's a great question. That's a really excellent question. Uh, I would, uh, I think the IR major is an excellent major. I know it's tremendously demanding, much more demanding than most majors. And, uh, and so it's a bit of an uphill struggle. I think you probably see yourself taking more required courses than like history majors, which is what I did and that kind of thing. I think that's excellent. I believe that IR includes some economics and that type of thing. I think that's excellent. Um, 
do, do a semester abroad. I, if you can't do a semester abroad, I, I would encourage you to do a semester abroad to improve a foreign language that you have. You know, if it's Spanish, go to Spain. Go to Argentina. If it's French, go to France. You know, uh, do a semester abroad. If you don't have a language skill, uh, you know, that doesn't mean you're, you know, in the very bottom of the, of the heap. Uh, I, get inter I get resumes of people who have done internships in the British Parliament, in the Scottish Parliament, which was kind of just re reconstituted a couple of years ago, I guess internships are available there, in the Canadian Parliament, or, or in the US uh, Congress. I, that stands out to me. It does stand out to me. A lot of times, um, a lot of times these are not paid internships. State has a lot of internships in embassies overseas. They'll pay you away, but they don't pay you any money. I realize that we all have to eat and you know that type of thing. Uh, but if you have the the financial wherewithal to do something like that, you know something that is going to make your resume stand out. Uh, I I encourage you to do that type of thing. Um, and and then uh, again, IR, you've got to spend some time overseas. You've got to build on that. Uh, uh, do some work locally if you can, that type of thing. Is that helpful to you in any way? Yeah. Maybe one or two more questions, I understand. So, a hand immediately. So, uh, okay, maybe this is a lame question. But in, okay. in your bio, I heard that you spent some time at the Naval Base in Key West, Florida. Yes, that's correct. And I just returned personally from an internship um, in Key West. I've just been back about two and a half weeks. So I just have a personal interest right. in your work there. Right. You did an internship at the Joint Interagency Task Force? No. no. No, it was different. I was just there for... It's okay. It, it's kind of a... I, I'm not an IR major. I'm an English major. So it's a little bit different line. I'm just here for fun. Oh. But. No, no. <laughs> um, what we do in Key West is a very, very unique situation. My organization, we have 10 bureaus overseas, and we, we uh, are located overseas regionally because historically when the thrust of our collection effort was radio and television, we could collect radio and television signals regionally at these bureaus that we set up. We're in Key West, Florida because it's the only place off the island of Cuba where you can listen to Cuban radio and television. Actually now, you can listen to uh, 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 Cuban radio on the internet. Uh, but you know, if something went went south, the Cubans would turn that access off immediately. Okay, So we're in Key West because we can listen to uh, Cuba from there. Open sources, again, we're only open source. And we used to manage Haiti and the Dominican Republic uh, from there. That, that was our interest in, in Key West. And I loved it there. I just thought it was magnificent. We have a BYU Spanish translation graduate working there full time doing uh, trans translation an analysis of Cuban media, and, and he absolutely loves it as well. So. Last question. The last question. Going? Going? Okay, going. Thank you very, very much. Great pleasure to come. Hope it was helpful.